you want to start an AI startup or you want to use AI in your company or you want to join an AI startup, this video is exactly for you. And in this video, I'm going to break down different kinds of AI companies using a simple framework called Faces. I'll get into the details of what Faces is, but the reason why this video exists in the first place is there's a lot of misconception about what is an AI company. I'm not getting into the memes of GPT rappers or, you know, you should not build a rapper company, but I'm here to break it down for you. How? and what kind of companies exist and if you were to get into one of these companies and what kind of companies that you can get into and what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages. We're going to discuss all these things in this video. This video is coming from an AI engineer perspective and also somebody who has designed GTM strategies like go to market strategies for companies that have consulted. So whatever that you're going to see is my personal opinion than some industry standard. Have you ever heard somebody saying that, oh, uh, you want to join this AI company? Do you know how to build a model? I mean, that's the first question that people usually ask. I have been personally asked this question that, okay, I'm hiring. Do you want to join my company? How many models have you built? And my first question is, first of all, I start laughing at them because you don't have to always build a model if you want were to be an AI company. That, that is something that I think a lot of people do not understand. And that is exactly why this particular framework is. Okay, to start with, if you do not have time, if you want to stop this video right now, this is the particular important section that you have to see and stop the video. What is this faces framework? The faces framework actually starts in the opposite order. So F A C E S the, at the bottom, we have got foundational model innovators. Like these are the guys who build foundation models. And then we have got adaptive fine tuners who take those foundational models and build things on top of it. Then we have got convenient A API providers and API wrappers. We're going to look at both the sides. We're going to see the API providers and also we're going to see the API wrappers. And then we have got essential infrastructure builders. These are the companies that help us run our existing AI startups and products. And finally, we have got standalone and integrated AI products. So we're going to see everything in detail, but I want to start with the foundational model innovators. I think this is a section that does not require a lot of introduction. Almost all the revolution about AI or at least the modern day chat GPT related AI has started from these kind of companies. So what are these companies? These are the companies that build these base models or foundational models or these days they started calling it a frontier model. So they build like these really, really large models and sometimes they release the model and sometimes they do not release the model. If you know any company other than OpenAI in this particular category, I want you to comment in this section so that I know that, you know, kind of audience that I'm talking to. But in my opinion, if you want to know, so OpenAI is the most popular foundational model innovators company. And in the open source side of the thing, Stability AI seemed to become that company, but somehow, you know, they fell through it. And now Mistral is another company that is somewhere in this particular bracket where they build foundational models. Of course, you cannot ignore Mr. Mark Zuckerberg, who is also in this particular category. But a very important thing that you have to know is this is at the strongest foundation. This is primarily an R&D company, a research and development company. And that's why you would see that OpenAI, Google DeepMind, Mistral, these companies hire a lot of research engineers. So they've got a lot of research engineers when you compare it with, let's say, somebody who will do DevOps, somebody who will do sales and marketing. So these are companies that have strongly rooted foundations in research because if they don't innovate, for example, there is a new technique like RLHF for alignment they have to innovate they are there is a new technique how they can scale training there is a new technique how they can add quality pre-trained data tra training data to the pre-training model so this this is this is the domain where they have to do it so if you were to start a company like this this is the i would say the hardest company to start with like it's 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 really the hardest if you were to start with you need a really solid research group people who can innovate, people who can innovate regularly at a constant pace with all the things that are happening around in the world. Another important thing is this is also a company where you will need a lot of money. You need a lot of compute to train these models. You need a lot of trust from investors who will not ask you any sort of money for a foreseeable uh, future so that you can go on train the model. In fact, if you know about OpenAI, before anybody could believe or execute that scaling loss can help, OpenAI kept on trying using these models, training these models for 
higher compute, um, higher data, like all these things, they were going for scale. And that is how we ended up having all these models that we use these days. And that is that is kind of an industry benchmark today. So if you were to start this company, this is one of the toughest company. If you were to join this company, then you probably need to be a research engineer to be in the core team. But again, you know, these companies hire a lot of different roles, developer relations, sales, GTM, marketing. In fact, OpenAI hires a lot of people for public policy because they want to influence government policies and talk to government officials and all these things. But anyways, uh, these are like the hardcore innovators who are driving everything else. But remember one thing, a foundation model itself cannot make anything out of it. Like you need people to build on top of it. And that is exactly why we have like other facets of this particular pyramid structure, because you need all these different companies to make it available, make AI available for everybody else. So if you think AI is electricity, this is like your electricity board or the people who set, generate electricity and with the mere electricity itself, you cannot do everything. And that is where the other sections, other layers of people come on top. So if somebody tells you that, can you build a model to start an AI company or can you build a model to join an AI company? Then the next question that you should have is like, are you going to pay me like open AI? Then of course you can build a model. I mean, you can learn how to build a model. But if you are not going to pay somebody to build a model, or if you're not going to pay at the level open AI, Google DeepMind and all these companies pay, then expecting somebody to build a foundation model, first of all, doesn't make sense at all. Second, do you have the compute? Do you have the time to build a foundation model? If none of these things work, do not start this company because you're going to lose. The next one in our list is adaptive fine, fine tuners. Uh, I have got a separate video in making that says that you should not do fine tuning for every single task that you do. But anyways, the point here is that these are the companies they build on top of these companies. So they take things from these companies and then they adapt it for whatever need that they want, whether it is fine tuning, whether it is using solutions like ritual augmented generation drag. So they take the models that are released by these companies and people use uh, things, build things on top of it, like one level top of it. These are not your API wrappers, like simply using an API and building something. These are companies that try to infuse their own knowledge, own custom documents, uh, integrate these LLMs like large language models within their workflow. So these are that kind of company. So what kind of companies are these adaptive fine tuners? Let's take a very big company like Salesforce, for example. If you do not know what Salesforce does, Salesforce is a company that has a SaaS solution software as a service solution for a very popular CRM. CRM stands for customer relationship management. So anytime you call somebody, you need to register like a hot lead and a cold lead in Salesforce and Salesforce does a lot of things for you. So it's a very expensive product. People, people made a lot of money out of it. So Salesforce is not going to take one of these models like Mistral or well, let's say um, Llama's model and then use it as it is. Salesforce would take this model and then do its own fine tuning on top of it. In fact, we have seen a lot of companies like Snowflake releasing foundation models, but even then we don't know how much of it is actually a foundation model or it has been built on top of some other existing model like Llama 3. So these are the companies that take these models, uh, these models that are built by the foundation models from these companies, let's say Mistral or you have uh, your Google Gemma and you have got Llama 3 and all these models and they fine tune it for their own use cases so that their company, their employees can use it in their own flavor rather than what the entire world is using it in that flavor. So it is very important to note that there are fine tuning th these companies that use these fine tuned models. Okay. So one side of the thing for this is the company that also lets you fine tune. The other side of the thing for this is the company that uses the fine tuning. So in every section, we are also going to see both the sides. The one is one who lets you fine tune. Like for example, there are companies like SaaS companies like Pretty Base. So these companies let you fine tune the model. So you can go to these companies like uh, they have easy to use options like GUI graphical user interface. You can fine tune the model. They let you build the fine tuned model. So that's what they do. Like you have got auto train from hugging face. You can add that to the list. So these are fine tuning tools and fine tuning companies in itself. The other side of the thing that we are talking about is the companies that use fine tuning models, fine tuned models. And I'm going to use Salesforce 
as an example here salesforce slack they might have like their own model but still the idea is they are using the fine tuned models in itself so this is the second category in our list so it's not as difficult as to build a foundational model but this is again a computation intensive task you need gpus for you to use it you need some kind of research engineers who can handle alignment who can handle like different techniques you've got a lot of techniques these days like lora is a very popular technique you use adapters to build certain things in the very recent apple presentation we got to know that apple swaps adapters so a lot of innovation happens in this particular space as well so you have to have the ability so you need research engineers but you also need a lot of uh, software engineers swe because not just that you are using fine tuned models but for you to use fine tuning you need platform you need to deploy the model so there is a lot of ml ops going on in here and when you were to deploy the model uh, you need to figure out the platform like infrastructure like the ones that we have here so you need to talk about this as well so you will make some connection from here to there and another important thing that you need to understand is a lot of these model innovators also started providing fine tuning as a service so like the example that we saw not the fine tuning consumer but the fine tuning producer so instead of using auto train or instead of using pretty base now open ai has its own fine tuning service mistral has its own fine tuning service google i think offers its own fine tuning service if i am not wrong so these companies have started realizing that fine tuning is some industry use cases everybody wants to do it so instead of letting somebody else eat our lunch let's provide the lunch so that uh, we can make money out of it so the, the there are companies like this but then the same there are companies like this but the same foundational companies also provide fine tuning service that is from the producer perspective then the, from the consumer perspective anybody can use these models but how will they use the model that's a very important question and that is where our next section comes into picture where we have got convenient api providers so these are the api providers who actually let us deploy the fine tuning model but we are not going to deploy the model ourselves they have deployed the model for us and then we can just simply use it there are a lot of companies and in fact these kind of companies are like quite in demand and this is a heavy bloodbath in terms of how you can make money at this point a lot of them are um, optimizing for cac uh, customer acquisition cost so they are just giving you a lot of offers uh, sometimes free credits just to get you on board so i in my personal guess these companies are losing a lot of money but uh, i mean as a consumer you wouldn't care much but if you were to join the company i would be very careful like there are a lot of companies at this point like there is together there is like i think fireworks and a lot of other fireworks fireworks yeah there are a lot of companies who provide apis for you to use these models and uh, the kind of things that these companies have to do in fact like for example like perplexity also got into this i'm i'm not sure like perplexity perplexity there is a spelling mistake perplexity yeah uh, i don't think they are actively po promoting this at this point like they are more into that uh, okay we are going to be a google replacement but even they got into it because you know you need a lot of software engineering skills here more than your ai researching skills more than your ai research skills you need a lot of software engineering skills because this is the place you are going to figure out how to reduce the latency of a model like when i say that there is one very popular model that comes to my mind probably all of your mind grok so all these companies exist with the same fundamental principle one reduce the cost for every token you are going to reduce the cost two how fast what is the latency in which they can reply for the first time for the second time for the third time and also that what kind of optimizations they can do and finally what is the uptime are they going to be up 100% what kind of things that they are doing but this is a heavily competitive space a lot of companies have been funded and a lot of companies are heavily burning vc money venture capitalist money so that means this is a company that if you were to jo join these kind of companies i would strongly encourage you to first check their roadmap check their um, arr like annual run rate and uh, check if uh, if they have a solid plan because otherwise you know what happens these companies are going to give heavy offers at the cost of cac they are going to onboard a lot of customers 
So these companies are burning a lot of cash. So I would be extremely careful about joining these companies. I might join one of these companies. I'm not saying I wouldn't join, but it is very important to understand what is that company trying to do different in the market other than just like smashing cost. For example, Grok has got its own advantage saying that they are the fastest inference service ever. That is their pitch. It's a very valid pitch. People love it because you know, the latency matters. Imagine you're taking your smartphone and then you're opening some app. If it takes like 10 seconds, if it takes 20 seconds, if it takes 30 seconds, there is definitely a, some sort of a difference in the user experience. So latency matters a lot in software engineering and Grok is trying to solve that, especially with their custom architecture and all the other stuff. So Grok has its unique advantage, whether Grok will uh, sustain or uh, survive the test of time. That's a different topic altogether. But then if you see other model, uh, other uh, services like fireworks together, they're in a very similar business A new model comes in, they onboard the model, they give you some kind of credit and they ask you to sign up and then you start using the model. Uh, it works fine. Like in fact, like a very popular company in this space is a replicate. They not just like work only with LLMs, but also they work with, let's say multi-model models, stable efficient models, image generation, all these things. And I know a lot of people have built successful products on top of replicate. So, uh, so it serves the scale. The point here is understand if you're going to join the company, understand the business, understand the USP and what kind of roles these companies hire for. They, they primarily hire a lot of people who have good software engineering skills. And also they hire from uh, the DevOps perspective, like ML ops perspective. They also hire a lot of uh, DevRels, not a lot, but at least they hire DevRels so that these developer relations or hacker and residence kind of role, they can build quick tutorials, uh, quick models, and uh, they can put the model. So they have like these kind of roles. They are somewhere in between the application layer and the foundation model layer because they cannot survive without the foundation model, but also they have to influence the application layer, like the, the, the integration integration that we have at this uh, end, the standalone and the integrated product. So they're somewhere exactly in the middle, trying to influence both the sides. So they need foundational model providers or model builders, innovators, and they also need somewhere at the top. And they also have to have a lot of software engineering skills to be able to sustain the market where it's like I said, it's a bloodbath. Uh, everybody's trying to cut cost. And uh, the next one in our pyramid is uh, one of the most important things, essential infrastructure builders. This is a section that uh, we often ignore when it comes to AI, but people don't even think that this is an essential thing. That is like the shame of this particular section because Everything that you build is going to sit on this. Uh, and this is where you have got your Microsoft Azure. You have got, uh, um, all the other providers, like where you can go deploy the models. Like for example, model labs is another popular model labs. They are compute provider, but you get the point. So this is the place where uh, they'll give you tools for observability, where they'll give you tools to monitor the LLMs, trace the logs. Uh, then you deploy the LLMs. Then you have got your own CI CD pipeline. So this is a place that gives you all these things. This is ex extremely important because a good software product cannot exist without having good infrastructure. I mean, it's, it's like everything else. Like if you want to build a good bridge, you need a good solid foundation. The foundation doesn't come only from the foundation model in itself. The foundation model just ensures the quality of the LLM that you use, but you need solid infrastructure to be able to manage all these LLMs running on these things. And mind you, these are not just simple models running on CPU. These are models heavily running on graphical processing units. So you need to be able to handle data center racks of GPUs and a lot of other things. So this is a very essential thing. And uh, there are not a lot of companies doing this kind of work. In fact, I've heard from multiple VCs, venture capitalists. This is one area a lot of people are targeting. So if you see our uh, entire this uh, pyramid that we have got, you can see that a lot of people or building in, um, so this foundation is like quite stacked. Like let's say it's like saturated. Very few people are doing a lot of people are trying to do fine tuning, offer fine tuning as a service, APA providers, super crowded, super crowded place. Everybody wants to start a company where you can uh, use one of the models as an API. So it's a super crowded place, but this place, essential infrastructure builders, people are still trying to figure out, okay, what kind of LLM ops do you need? And if you're not familiar with the DevOps in a simple language, every time you have a software product, you have to take the software product from your local computer or local development environment, put it in a production environment. So you've got dev, 
staging and then prod so you've got dev staging and prod so dev is like local computer you have got in your macbook then you have to move it to staging then you have to do move it to prod and this process has to be seamless and how do you make sure that this process is seamless and how do you make sure that there is no bug whenever there is a bug you fix it and all these things come under essential infra builders because without them your software systems are going to crumble and now with agents and llms this is becoming further more and more important there are companies specifically like there for example there is a company called agent ops and uh, their only pitch is that they will take your agents and move it to prod that's what their promises and that they can do it because they are building on top of other infra providers so hugging face would also fall under this thing because hugging face has got its own compute uh, while there are a lot of places where hugging face could fall this is another place where hugging face is falling because it's a platform company you want a platform like aws bedrock where you can use the model as an api but also you have got an infrastructure there because you can take your own sage maker deploy a model leave it there so this is a very essential thing and it's not just about like model serving i would say uh, model serving can be done from here uh, but this is about how or what all the things that you need for an llm based ai based uh, saft saas or software product to sustain successfully it starts from your deployment devops it uh, goes till observability tracing and um, finding bugs and a lot of other things that you would typically do it in software this is another place where you might need very little ai engineers you need a lot more software engineers you just need a little bit of knowledge about what is an ai um for example if you are agent ops you would probably need to know like when do you need agent and all the other things but otherwise you are dealing only with software code so it it is a, like a lot of software engineers and they would also hire devrel like developer relations and another important thing is this is a place where you will see a lot of company hiring kernel level programmers because you need to influence at that level for you be able for that company to uh, create a really good efficient infrastructure so if you know cuda kernel programming if you know programming at let's say low level machines this is the place where you will see a lot of people getting hired another important role these companies hire is called solution architect especially this is a role that you would predominantly see in companies like google and nvidia because they have got their own infra and they want to onboard a client to that and for that client to come here somebody has to give them a solution uh, the solution architecture's role is exactly the same they will design a solution architect solution architecture in such a way that they can onboard these clients into onto their own platforms so solution architect solution architect is added the role that you can get into in these kind of companies which is actually a good role but still this is a core software engineering principle very less ai happening but mostly software engineering and they ensure that our applications run safe sound 100% up um, you can do all sort of things in this particular area and i've heard from vcs that this is the biggest gap in uh, the entire ai stack like if you see our ai stack so this is a place you know a lot of people cannot compute so sorry compete so you are done this is a place okay okay uh, and this is a place it is super crowded and uh, this one we are going to talk about this is also super crowded and also you know uh, having your moat here is very difficult but this the essential infrastructure builders this is exactly where there is a lot of money at this point a lot of vcs are interested a lot of gap in the market so if you have got a good software engineering principle or if you have got skills to sell good software engineering principles this is where you should start a company essentially and uh, not not one of the easiest ones definitely difficult i've seen a lot of companies come and go also in this particular space but if you want to have a moat um, and you don't have like a you know crazy amount of money like open ai this is probably where you can conveniently go but this is again going to be a company it's not going to be a one person business it is again going to be a company you need a team you need all those things now finally we are getting into an interesting space which i am also quite interested in because i don't have a lot of money and i'm also one person team then you go at the very top layer which we call the stand alone and integrated ai products basically you are building ai products the product could be of two types one it could be a stand alone ai product two it could be an integrated ai product what what do i mean by that an integrated ai product is a product in which 
AI is integrated. Like for example, Notion was there. So before before all these AI things, Notion was there. And uh, somehow when AI came, uh, Notion AI came into picture. As simple as that. They just took GPT-4, GPT-3.5 API, figured out a few use cases, integrated very well within their product. As simple as that. So Notion with AI become Notion AI. As simple as that. So this is what I call as integrated AI products. So your product at a fundamental level, it has its own use case. It has its own purpose. The product itself can survive without AI. I mean, not in terms of business, but the product works without AI. So AI is just an added feature to it. It's an integration to it that makes it further more appealing, more lucrative. So that is what your AI or integrated AI products. Now, what is a standalone AI product? So these are the products where AI is at its core. So without AI, this, this cannot survive. Like for example, Jasper or uh, any copywriting tool that you take. So those products do not survive without AI in, uh, at its core. So it's, it's like your core engine. What is it powered by? Is it powered by, let's say some other fuel, some other business, or is it actually powered by AI? So, and this is the place where if you see, you have got all the GPT wrappers, and this is the place where you can also go easily make some quick bucks and return because all you need to do is you need a successful idea. You need to start marketing the product and you can be a one member team, like an indie hacker, a solo entrepreneur. The reason is because all you need to do is you need to identify a problem in a domain. I'll give you an example. So if let's say you're a software engineer, uh, you don't know a lot of things you typically code in, let's say react stack. So all you know is a react stack and in a typical react stack, uh, you know how to build a full stack application. But the question is now you want to build an AI SaaS, uh, AI uh, product. So now what you're going to do, you're going to just figure out, you cannot do AI integrated product because you don't have an existing product. This is for companies that has existing products. So what you're going to do, all you're going to do is you're going to identify one particular problem for one particular domain. So you're going to say you have a website, people have a website and for the website, people have, can I integrate a chatbot? That's all you're going to say. And you know how to integrate a chatbot. So you need a website. That means you need rag and you need a chatbot. That means you need an LLM. So all you need is you need to figure out how to do rag how to integrate an LLM and with API service providers, it's very easy to integrate an LLM and some API service providers also let you do RAG instead of you doing RAG separately. So probably somewhere you take Llama index and you take GPT-4 Wo and you combine that you have a successful product. Now you put this inside your React application, slap a login page, an authentication page, Stripe payment. That's it. You have a successful, I mean, you have a, you have a successful AI SaaS that is yet to make money, but you have a full end to end product. And that is exactly why this is one of the most lucrative, low hanging fruits. And this is also a place why a lot of VCs are very skeptical to invest in this particular place because now you have AI for everything. You have AI for Word document, AI for Excel, you have AI for PowerPoint, uh, give a prompt, get a PowerPoint slide, give a prompt, get a blog post, give a prompt, get a video. So you have all these companies competing in this particular space. So it's very hard to figure out what is a moat. And um, if you don't care about moat, you want to like quickly make money, enter, exit, uh, quickly make money. I think this is the best place to do it. And instead of building your own standalone tool uh, for something so generic, you can just go specifically for a particular domain. You can build a tool for doctors. You can build a tool for engineers. You can build a tool only for civil engineers. You can build a tool only to like, for example, one of the popular applications they have from stable diffusion is virtual tryout. So you can take this, move, uh, remove this cloth, put another cloth um, brand deals, uh, take the phone, put it in somebody's hand and do it. This is the most, e this is the most exciting space for me because for my skills, technically speaking, to be honest, I'm a software, I can't, I'm, I'm like a software engineer, but not like the best software engineer at the top of the leaderboard in Olympiad or lead code. I'm an AI engineer, but I'm not like the best AI engineer where I'm working for opening it. So if I'm like Jack of all trades, master of none or master of one, I would probably do something in the standalone integrated AI product space. If I'm working for a company, I would tell them, okay, go ahead, integrate AI into your product. If I'm not working for a company, then I would say, okay, 
I'm going to just come up with three or four applications and all these are going to have EA at its core and it is going to be super easy for me to build it because I'm going to use one of the wrappers like for example I'm going to use either OpenAI, Gemini, Mistral or I'm going to go to this convenient API providers and use them because it's very easy for me to switch like I can use Llama today, I can use Mistral tomorrow or I can have a stack where I've got Llama and Mistral and all these things. I can build agents on top of it. So this is one of the exciting things. Like when I wanted to make this video, I wanted to make this video only about this. But then I thought like a lot of people look uh, look down on this, like this particular domain. They're like, uh, you're not bringing any innovation. See, at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself, you need to be honest and you need to ask yourself, what is your objective? And innovation doesn't only mean when you new build a new model. I, I think this is another a very wrong principle that people have got. Not every new model is adding a lot of benefit to the society. I will, I'll, I'll be very honest. In fact, you're doing bad to the society by burning a lot of energy and compute because you're emitting CO2. Uh, maybe your data center is inside the middle of the ocean like Microsoft or Azure. But you know, to be honest, by building new models, you're not doing anything great. Rather, when you build an application at the top, and you provide it to somebody who has a niche and that is where you add actual value. So if you go with the same analogy, like for example, AI is like electricity. This layer, this particular layer that we are talking about, this layer is exactly where people are going to use it. So your microwave comes here, your refrigerator comes here, um, your let's say bulb comes here, all these things come, uh, I mean why I'm here, yeah here, here, here because this is exactly the place where people actually use and benefit from somebody that you have built. What OpenAI has built will not go to the hands of people if you do not build something at the top, which is the application layer or standalone AI products layer. The custom fine-tuned models will not see the light of the day if you do not integrate it into the product. Convenient API providers will be out of business if nobody is building business on top of them. Essential infrastructure builders do not have to exist if there is no app or AI product on top of them. So everything rolls up to that moment, but that is also the lowest hanging fruit. Technically, this should be like inverted so that you know, it's very easy for you to realize that this entire thing is just what you can do is this entire thing actually is like this. This is the most difficult part to get in. This is the most easiest part, like the easiest low hanging fruit for you to jump into AI is this. And you jump with a very simple API wrapper, then you slowly build on top of it. Okay, you take the infra, move it to your custom infra. Maybe you start using fine tuned models. Maybe you start using uh, different service providers. And I mean, if you are going to be something with a lot of VC money, then you build your own foundation. model. This is what a lot of companies have done. Like for example, Snowflake, you could see Snowflake releasing their own foundation model now, but I bet they wouldn't have started with the foundation model in itself. There are easier ways to integrate AI. I mean, unless until you care about data privacy and all these things, even then you can pick one of the essential infra providers and then you can tell them, okay, uh, I'll take compute from you like a pod, and I will deploy my own open source model from foundation model innovators. I will create myself an API and then I will do it now. I don't have to be worried about data privacy or uh, data protection data residency where the data resides because it resides inside your own VM virtual machine. So this is definitely one of the most exciting spaces where you can go innovate, build something, make some money out of it. Also, this is a place if you're going to work for somebody, you have to be very careful because nobody has a moat. Everybody's burning on cash. Uh, there is a lot of CAC play here, like customer acquisition cost. So if you're going to work for one of these companies, you need to be like, what I'm going to do with this company, what the company is doing different from somebody else. Now you've got a lot of companies building their own agents. You've got a lot of companies trying to say that, okay, we are AI for this. In fact, I'll show you like, I don't know if you know about AI grant, AI grant uh, from Nate Silver. So if you go to AIgrant.com, so you will see a lot of these companies and these are like handpicked companies by one of the best, let's say accelerators in the world, Nate, Fried Nate Friedman and Daniel Gross. So if you go see these companies, you will get an idea about for every company here, you will probably see like 10, 20 similar companies in the world. So for example, let's say Pika cutting edge generative video. Uh, this was the batch two company, but now you have got, let's say other than Pika, you have got runway, you've got Luma. 
And where do these companies stand? You can say that these companies stand at the foundation model innovators because they are building their own video models. At the same time, they have a really good infrastructure that they can make this entire thing available as an API. So you go pick one more company, MathPix. MathPix is simply uh, somewhere very at the top. So MathPix is a standalone AI product. In fact, it is an integrated AI product. What MathPix does, you can take a screenshot of let's say a math equation using AI, it can give you in latex or other formats. So that is somewhere at the top. So um, let's take one more company for an example. Um, you have Julius, which we have seen on the channel, AI for data scientists, very top. You have got light paper, AI assembly lines for wo knowledge workers. You have Photola, AI powered creativity tools for kids. Espresso AI, optimize Snowflake query using LLMs, somewhere between infrastructure and also at the top, you have got Autogen AI, generate bid proposal using LLMs. So you can see for every infra company, for every foundation company, for every API company, you would see like hundreds of application companies or standalone EA companies. And that is how the world actually works. You, you don't have like 100,000 Google. You don't need 100,000 Google, but you need 100,000 niche tools because every domain is different. Everybody is different. So this is exactly where you can go make a difference. To quickly summarize the video, we started learning about different kinds of AI companies. We leveled it up and then we said, okay, we are going to start with a framework called Faces. At the bottom of Faces, we have foundation model innovators, adaptive fine tuners, and they've got, we have got convenient API providers or API wrappers. So providers are the ones who give you API, wrappers are the ones who use the API and build something. Essential infra builders. And finally, I've got standalone and integrated AI build products or uh, tools. Uh, so I hope this was helpful to you. If you have any question, let me know in the comment section. See you in another video. Happy, happy prompting.